I'd like us to pray together. We have uh, a list of needs, and I want you to just join with me and agree with me in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you that nothing is too hard for you. And we thank you, Lord, that you hear us when we pray. And thank you, Lord, for the miracles and signs and wonders, the huge answers to prayer. Thank you, Lord, that Jared is, is doing better, Hallelujah. making great progress. Bless you, Jesus. And we thank you for that, Lord. We pray for Justin and Leith and Ilias, that you'll draw them to yourself. Thank you for the the miracles in Roxanne's body that you'll continue to heal her. Touch our sister Sonia Middleton and Leon and Robert Spencer. God, continue to pour out healing on them. Mike and Lori Cooley. Janet, Jewel, Jashandra, and Jamea. Lord, we just put all of these in your hands and we, we thank you, God that you're our healer, you're our healing. We, we pray for Grandma Jan. Lord, as she is on her way to California to take care of her sister that's in hospice and is ready to go home to be with you, Lord, we pray for that safe passage and that sweet, tender passage on home to be with you and, and protect Grandma Jan as she travels. Lord, and give her your favor in every way. Bring her back to us safely. <coughs> Lord, and on this day, the National Fallen Firefighters Day <coughs> of Remembrance. Lord, we thank you for all of our first responders that put their lives on the line every minute of every day for us. And Lord, we pray for their families. We thank you for, for groups like Tunnel the to Towers that are paying mortgages and, and covering the, the needs of, of these, Lord, and we pray your blessing poured out. We pray your favor, Lord. We pray for extra protection for our first responders. Lord, and may we honor them. May we thank them and appreciate them often, as often as we can. God, thank you for their sacrifice. Help us to be thankful to them too, God, we pray. We thank you for all these things, Lord, and we give you all the honor and all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Last week, we, we talked about from Matthew chapter 4, when you are tempted... If you weren't here or you didn't get a chance to see that video on our church Facebook page or YouTube, I want to encourage you to, to get it. There's even some extra copies of last week's outline, I believe, still on the back table. Uh, some great how-tos following the example of our Lord Jesus on how to win the war on temptation. Praise the Lord. This morning, as I felt the Holy Spirit lead me, I want to talk to you about the anatomy of a temptation. <coughs> Did you know temptations had an anatomy? <laughs> they do. And we're gonna we're gonna look at it from the Word of God this morning. Would you turn in your Bibles if you haven't already to James chapter one, beginning of verse twelve? Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it brings, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. <coughs> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for revealing these things to us. And we pray today, Lord, that you will help us 
to understand the process and become victorious as we win the battle over temptation with the help of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Friends, uh, temptation is a process. You, we don't just go from yeah. from uh, light to dark, <laughs> right? Yeah. It is. There are steps involved, and, and the Holy Spirit has outlined them here for us today. And, and I hope you brought your pen. <coughs> if you didn't, there are some in the back, and I hope you'll take some notes. Let's look at the first step of the process of the anatomy of temptation. God is not the one who tempts you. And you need to know that. And, and it's clear that the Holy Spirit put that in the Word of God in James chapter 13. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He Himself tempt anyone. So when temptation comes, friends, it is from the devil or his imps or your flesh or other people that are typically being led by Satan to try to bring you down, take you out. Yeah. And it's so, first of all, it's important that you know that God is not the one who tempts you. The second step, important point, is when you are tempted, that first thought of evil. James 1.14, but each one is tempted. In fact, you know, uh, you can write it down. You are going to be tempted. Even if you have served the Lord a very long time, you're still going to be tempted. Go ahead and say amen, Pastor. No, it's true. You may be the sweetest. You may be the most holy. You may have loved and served Jesus for a long time. You may have all the commandments memorized and, and on the placed on the back side of your eyelids, you know, on, on your bathroom wall and all that fun stuff, on the fridge. You're still going to be tempted until the trumpet sounds or they throw dirt in your face. You're going to be tempted. And it's so important that you know that. You don't want to, you don't want to arrive at some horrible temptation someday and, and say to yourself, oh, you know, I, I thought I was above that. Hey. Long as long as you still have blood flowing through your veins, you're going to be tempted. And friends, that is the place where temptation can be and should be stopped. Right there. At that first thought of evil. At that first thought of temptation. And when you have that first thought, friends, it's important that you have those Bible verses memorized and you Start firing it away in Jesus' name. You start quoting <coughs> that scripture. That will give you the strength and the tools to win the victory right there. Because that's where the Lord wants you to win the victory. He doesn't want you to go through the rest of the steps. Amen? Amen. Come on. He wants you to win it right there. And he, he will give you uh, the verses. You can find them easily. And you'll be able to win the war simply by stopping it right there and quoting that verse. Just like Jesus did. We talked about that last week. The third step is when you are drawn away, you are having a strong imagination. In other words, you're having this battle in your mind. Should I or shouldn't I? This is the place where we talk about the devil whispering in one ear and the angel whispering in the other. When you are drawn away, friends. And, and a lot of the times it feels like you're being dragged away, kicking and screaming. Right? Or at least something like that. This is another very important place for you to take authority and to stop the temptation in its tracks right there. Very vulnerable spot. And it's important when you're, when you're feeling those feelings of being drug away. Another great passage which we might look at in a couple of weeks is 1 Corinthians 10, 31 that talks about when we are tempted, God will provide a way out. This is the time right here at, at step three. 
That's, that's two and three, where God, where the Holy Spirit is yelling at you, screaming at you, trying to get your attention. This is the place where we do what the Bible says, and we flee temptation. You tighten up those tinny runners and run if you need to. Get away from Get out of that place. Get out of your head. Get, that, get, get to another spot. Get some worship music going. Get on your face. Get on your knees in prayer. Get your Bible out quickly. And get to those scriptures that will help you win the battle. Because you are being drug away. Amen? <laughs> Can I get a witness so far? Praise the Lord. Yes, amen. Okay, good. You've all, we've all been down this road. You, if you say no, you're lying. I love you anyway. Uh, it's true of all of us, as long as we're human anyway. Uh, then we move on to step number four. When you have strong desire, in other words, the sin of lust, and you enjoy sin for a season, and it, it you know, lusting after things or people or position. And you do whatever sin that the devil is tempting you or someone else is tempting you away. James chapter 1 verse 14. When you are drawn away by your own desires. At that point, friends, is another point of deep vulnerability. And in some cases, you have already passed the point of no return. Because you've moved on to that place of a strong desire. You are lusting after that thing or person or whatever it is. Right? Right. You start enjoying that sin. And the enjoyment is a lie from hell. And Satan is trying to trap you in his scheme to destroy you. You are having that strong desire. Step number four. There is no such thing as enjoying sin for a season. Yeah, there is. It is a brief moment. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Because we come to step number five. When you are enticed. In other words, your will has <coughs> been weakened. And you're in that... You're even deeper into that dangerous spot. James chapter 1, verse 14. When you are drawn away by your own desires and enticed. Your will has been weakened and you're following into a pit of a pile of garbage that looks and smells really sweet. But that sweet smell is only temporary because in a flash it will become a place of filth and rot and destruction. Ugh. They say, Ugh. Yeah. Yuck. That's right. That's how you should respond. Because that's what your temptation will do. At this point, Satan and evil and sin have got their hooks in you. And you're in trouble. You have been enticed. Then we move to step number six. That says when lust is conceived, in other words, you yield or you give in, you surrender fully to that temptation. James chapter 1 verse 15 says, then when desire has conceived, oh boy, and she does, she will. If she, if, she, I shouldn't say she, if it, don't want to, it's not the lady's fault. Right? If it, if 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 uh, temptation, if desire is allowed to conceive, it will. Someone has said it'll it'll take you further than you ever thought it would, and it will cost you more than you ever dreamed. That's right. It's true. It's true. You have fallen over. You fell, you fell into that pit that you wanted. Did 
You say, wait a minute. I, yeah, yeah. You said, okay, let's go. Let's do this horrible, dirty, awful, nasty thing. It was the pit you wanted and you fell right into it. And that didn't just go knee high. You're, you're in over your head. You've fully given in to temptation and you've completely lost control. You did one of the most dangerous things that a person could ever do and that is you took off the safety belt. And you have ignored the warning lights. And you've gone over the guardrails and now you're in a free fall. This is serious stuff, friends. You know what? It's okay to, to talk about reality. In fact, you know, most of the time when you come to Portland Metro Church, you're not going to get stuff that's going to tickle your ears. You're going to hear the word of God. And I hope you will always pray for me and whoever follows me. If, if there is one until Jesus comes, uh, that it will always be the word of God. And, and we don't, we're not shooting at anybody, we're not beating anybody up, we're just saying Friends, you and I need to hear what the Word of God says, not just stuff that makes us feel all warm and fuzzy and, and go home and get angry with somebody in the parking lot. You know, yeah, okay. <laughs> which, which after the lust is conceived, we move to step number seven, when sin is committed. The sinful act is done. James 1.15, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. The sinful act is done. You've sinned against God, yourself, your body, your mind, and probably other people. And the weight of sin and the consequences of your sin are starting to take place in your life. Like a dog, you've returned to your own bond. Like a pig once washed, now you've returned to wallow in the slop again. Oh, maybe you shouldn't have said again, but, but anyway, you've returned to wallow in the slop. You know what else you've done? You've removed yourself from the blessing of God. You have stepped out from under the umbrella. And you basically said, Satan, have at it. Here I am. I'm all yours. Right? Dangerous, 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 dangerous place, friends. God will not bless sin. will not bless rebellion. He calls us to be holy, even as he is holy. And friends, we, we wear that as a badge of honor. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be holy. We, we can win the war. We can walk in victory. We will walk in victory. We are walking in victory in the name of Jesus. That is the will of God for you and I, friends. He doesn't want you and I walking in shame a single minute. He doesn't want you and I walking in guilt a single minute. He wants us to walk in holiness. And we'll talk about that a little more in a few minutes. Let's move to the last point number eight. When death comes, the natural result of our sin. And friends... Now, how are you doing so far? Everybody, everybody still alive? Amen. Nobody hyperventilating? No. All right, here we go. James 1, 15, and, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth <coughs> death. We, we have that in our own lives as a result of our behavior. We've experienced some of it uh, in the past as a result of somebody else's sin. But it always brings forth death. Friends, death is the natural consequence of our sin. And 
it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. It kills you spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, and many other ways. It kills your relationships with your family, with your friends and other people. It bears the fruit of shame and death in your kids and future generations if you don't turn around, if you don't change it. And, and we're going to get to the good stuff and we're going to talk about changing it in just a couple minutes here, friends. But it's important that you and I understand where we are and what we've done when we have allowed sin to be in control and the, and the process of sin to bring death. Thankfully, friends, the, the cross comes and interrupts all of that in our lives. Yeah. If we let it. See, you see, part of the thing that you and I need to understand is you only live one life. You're only living one life. There's, there's not a there's not a, a life that you live during the week at work, at home, at school, and a life you live when you put on a smile and go to church. There's no two lives. There's only one life. And God calls you and I to walk in holiness, walk in his will and walk in his ways so that we don't carry shame and guilt and our sin. and We don't carry death because Jesus came to give us life. And he wants us to walk in his ways and walk in that life. Praise the Lord. So can we review real quickly and we'll go on? It all starts with allowing that thought to linger in your mind. Allowing that suggestion to linger in your mind. And then you allow yourself to be drawn or dragged away. And then you allow yourself to have that strong desire. And then you allow yourself to be enticed and your will to go weak. And then you yield to temptation and give, uh, and lust gives birth to sin. And then your sin gives birth to death. And, and the big lie is that it doesn't affect anyone. I can do this and nobody else will see or be affected or involved. That's a lie. Everybody around you, your family, your friends, they know and, <laughs> and they are affected. Numbers 32, 23, as the Lord was helping Israel deal with their sin, he said to them, be sure. Oh, be sure. Your sin will find you out. <laughs> there, in other words, uh, you may think that, that you're uh, going to get away with it. You may think the devil, you may buy, be buying the devil's lies saying nobody else will know, nobody else will be affected. No, they will be. And your sin will come, the consequences of your sin will come. And they won't stop with your generation. They will affect the generations to follow. Friends, and, and if you'll let me stop here for just a minute. Uh, I, I, I said it earlier, I just feel I need to say it again. You can break what, what is called, and we'll talk about this another time, a little deeper. Uh, we, talk, we talk about the term generational curses. When you invite Jesus to come into your life, those curses are broken. When you, when you confess and repent, those curses are broken in the name of Jesus. Now, you still have the work to keep them broken. When the temptations to follow in mommy or daddy's footsteps of their sin come, you still have to say, no, I will not. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes. And that, that is it's so important that you know. 
You know, I, I've had conversations with people that are close to me that I love that, that have said things to me like, well, it's just a generational curse. And I say to them, no, no, no. You, you said the first word is okay, but the second word is choices. Generational choices. And you are, now that you are uh, no longer in your mommy's lap, you are fully responsible for your own behavior. And so you're making choices. Doesn't matter what mommy and daddy did anymore. You are making choices. Amen? Sometimes you and I need to grab ourselves by the nap of the neck and stand ourselves up in front of the mirror and say, Stop making those stinking choices! No, oh, there weren't very many amens for that, so I think we'll just move right along. Praise the Lord. I want you to, if you still have your Bible open to James chapter 1, I want you to look at, at the next verse after 15. It's the verse of James chapter 1, verse 16. Where James says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. This is very important, friends, because temptation usually starts with a lie. Being deceived is where temptation begins. Satan came to Adam and Eve in the garden and deceived them. And he's still doing that to you and me today. It's important that you and I have as much of the Word of God memorized and deep in our heart and on our mind so that we immediately, when we are tempted, we can quote those powerful words that help us get free from that temptation. If there's going to be any repentance, friends, that's the time. Now is the time, immediately. Whenever, whenever you realize that you have sinned and it's time to repent and confess, uh, the sooner you do that, the better. Because you will stop the consequences sooner. In fact, uh, I even uh, hand wrote in my notes, there are times when after you've sinned and you're, you're uh, wallowing in that self-pity, you don't have to raise your hand. All of us have experienced it. That, that is a tough time because you're still wanting to kick yourself a few more times and beat yourself up a few more times and you're just not feeling like saying, please forgive me, Lord, I'm sorry. In fact, you know what? One of my most favorite illustrations of the grace of God is when we commit that sin a second time and we go to God and we say, God, I did it again. The Holy Spirit immediately says back to us, I have no record of you ever doing that before. It's been washed away. Amen. Okay, thank you. Hallelujah, friends. So you don't have to carry shame or guilt or any of that yuck that the devil's trying to get you. But, he, but the point is, even when you don't feel like it, it's important to start the repentance process immediately. Immediately. And you may have to force yourself a little bit. You may have to start out with a little whisper. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And then you'll be able to say it again as many times as you need to. Mostly for you. God hears it on the first time grants forgiveness immediately. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. The next thing to do after you confess and repent is to set up some safeguards. You might want to write that in your notes. To keep you from falling into that same temptation again. We don't, we don't say, Satan, get behind me and push real hard and shove me back into that same temptation. No. We say, Satan, I've put up safeguards. Whatever that is. Whether it's, you know, internet filters or, or uh, 
having a brother or sister that you trust that you can talk to and pray with that's going to be there for you that you can call in the middle of the night and say, I'm, I'm, I'm being tempted. Will you pray with me right now? Whether it's a bottle or a needle or drugs or whatever it is. Whatever it is. Whatever temptation. That you can call somebody. That you put safeguards in place. You might even... You know, you might be so deeply into it that you need to say, need to set up with somebody that you trust, uh, can I come over in the middle of the night if I'm having that much of a struggle? Can I call you in the middle of the night? Yeah, we, oh, you guys, we, we need that kind of safeguard. We need that kind of, of guardrail. Because God... God wants you to win. God wants you to be victorious. God doesn't want you to be bound up in shame and guilt and, and a big pile of consequences. He wants you to know that, that He forgives immediately and He'll help you set up the guardrails. Amen. Well, James tells us about the anatomy of temptation, but he also tells us how to recover. And if you have your Bibles, would you flip over a, a page or two to James chapter 4, beginning with verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have that underlined. I hope you have that highlighted. That is one of the most important passages of Scripture for victorious Christian living. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Then it goes on to say, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God, God will never push you away. If you're drawing near to him, he's going to welcome you. He's going to run after you with open arms and welcome you and hug you and kiss you and put a, a ring on your finger and a robe on your back and, and throw a party. Praise the Lord. Cleanse your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And watch this. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. That's right. So if you've given in to temptation and sin, this is the road to recovery right here. And it first begins with submitting to God. Whatever it takes. Break, tear down whatever keeps you from submitting to God. Ruin everything that keeps you from submitting to God. Well, Pastor John, I've got a reputation I've got to keep up. I, I've got a, an appearance I've got to keep up. Well, you guys, if you have to throw that thing down on the ground and tromp all over it, do it. So that you can submit to God. Oh, but I'm, but my, my pride just won't let me. Oh, friends, you got to kill that old pride. If you're if you're gonna stop the consequences of disaster coming in your life and those behind you, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to whip that old pride and get rid of it. Throw it down before the cross and let Jesus help you get rid of that thing in Jesus' name. Amen. And, and then resist the devil and he will flee from you. Just a little repetition here to help you understand how important it is. Drawing near to God and He'll draw near to you. And then that powerful phrase, cleanse your hands and purify your heart. There are things that we must do. It is not just a faith only. It is a faith and works. There are things you and I have to do in order to put up the guardrails, in order to put up the safeguards so that we are not easily tempted and so that we don't give in to temptation. Gotta, gotta, gotta clean your hands. And then purify that heart, oh God. Lord, you know, and that, that comes from repentance, that comes from confession. And, and asking the Holy Spirit to come and purify your heart. And then, and then that, that phrase, stop being double-minded. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, that 
that is so important because you know as long as we are leaving the door open for the temptation we are double minded and we are headed for disaster you can't leave the door open you got to close that door you got to you got you got to get some some really good uh, caulking and you got to caulk the cracks where that door is and then you got to get uh, some bricks and some mortar and you got to put up a wall of brick and mortar so that nobody ever knows so you never know where that door ever ever existed and so satan cannot even knock on that door amen amen to stop being double minded don't leave the door open and then then notice where it says repent Say, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me. Mourn and weep, you know. Uh, I pray, I pray you never have to bear the consequences of the kinds of sin where, where you weep and mourn. I've, I've sat with people, I've prayed with people, I've helped people get back on the road to victory that were falling completely apart because they were recognizing the consequences of their sin. They were experiencing the consequences of their sin. Friends, and, and, and it's okay to weep and mourn. That, that mourning, that, that weeping will be like a medicine to get the poison out. Come on. Amen. And then, ladies and gentlemen, it's interesting, you know, that, that James here in fourth chapter four, verses seven through ten, starts with submitting to God, and then he ends with humbling yourself before God. Humbling yourself. And and if if you've committed sin, it's important <coughs> at that point to just say, God, I did it. And I ask you to forgive. Lord, I, I let the spirit of stupid come on me. And I'm sorry I did. Please forgive me and help me to set up the guardrails. I said we were going to come back to 1 John 1 9. Because it's this this principle is all the way through the scriptures, you guys. Satan will lie to you your flesh will lie to you people will lie to you but here's what the word of God says we confess our sins God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness there is immediate forgiveness available there is immediate reconciliation all you have to do is repent. All you have to do is confess. And, and the Holy Spirit will come and help you do the rest. In fact, I believe as well that if our heart is tender and we are not wanting to walk away from God, we don't want to walk in shame, we don't walk in sin, uh, I believe the Holy Spirit is there quickly trying to get us to come to the place quickly of confession <coughs> so that we can be washed and cleansed. You don't have to stay in that. And, and you know what? It, and it's important for you and I to tell the people in our lives that we have opportunity to that they don't have to stay in shame. I, I know people. That I, I know of I know of some families that generation after generation after generation. I know about three generations of them that walk in shame because of the sins of their parents and grandparents that were never confronted. And they just carried that on. They they are walking like you know, with one hand over their one eye and they can't see it, don't recognize it. That is not God's will, you guys. Amen. You know what? The devil will 
will come and try to tell you that because of this or that, it's okay for, for you to not be holy. And that's just a big pile of baloney. There, there are times when the devil will come to you and say, well, God knows that it's just so hard for you. You little whiny little God knows that you just can't do it. There's a lie. There's not the, it's not the truth. You can. You will. You are. In Jesus' name. And it doesn't matter what that other person is doing. And what the devil is trying to do. You are and you can. You will walk in victory. If you choose to do that. And if you choose to let the Lord help you. I feel like I'm saying it this way so that you know what to say to those around you. That those watching this video will know how to get the help they need. Guys, we can, God wants you and I to walk in victory. God wants everybody to walk in victory. You don't have to, you don't have to give in any longer. You don't have to be duped and deceived any longer. 